Now, Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, our last show before the election, so we're going to do a little on politics. Though later on in the show, we're going to hear from Christine Kaneen. She is she works for Higher Image. She runs Higher Image, and they do background checks, and she's actually becoming the chair of their national organization, and she works right here out of Johnson, so we're going to talk about that. But right now, I'm very pleased to be joined from the Rhode Island Public Expenditure Council, RIPEC, the think tank uh, extraordinaire in Rhode Island, John Simmons and Kelly Rogers. Thank you both for being here. Pleasure. So we're going to talk about the ballot questions. This is when you go to vote next week, you'll have seven questions in Rhode Island on the statewide ballot, and nobody knows them better than these folks who crunch the numbers so the rest of us can just write them up and make charts and all that good stuff. So we're going to walk you through those to get you ready for Election Day. So let's start right from the beginning. Um, so John, we the first two questions, there are seven, are about Newport Grand. And we've actually done shows, uh, regular viewers will know earlier in the year, with the opponents and proponents and op uh, proponents of that. Um, this isn't about borrowing money like the other ones. This is different. So what are these two questions to do, and why do we have to vote on Newport Grand? Yeah, the Constitution requires that you uh, have a, a vote of the local municipality to approve uh, gaming uh, location and change of the nature of gaming. So it goes from just the videos to uh, table games as well. So this authorizes it, author authorizes in a sense the terms and the conditions that were put into the statute. Uh, detailing how the gaming is to be done. on. So we have to Kingdom. change the Rhode Island Constitution yes. slightly to, to allow for, Joe Paolino and his yes, investors to right. build what yeah. they want. Yes, they have to have a vote of the, of the electorate of both the state. Overall state has to approve it as well as the local jurisdiction. And the second question is actually to put it into the Constitution. No location can be changed without the voter approval. Now why is uh, why is this a big deal to people in the rest of the state gambling, Newport Grand, casinos? You know, why is it on the ballot and why is it something that's yeah, so much discussion? If you take the broader picture, gaming in particular about the third largest revenue the state has. And the Newport Grand is one of the uh, two facilities that the state has. It's a smaller revenue item for the state. It's over a $20 million revenue item for the state. The existence, the long-term existence of that facility is really in question because of the activity that's occurring in Massachusetts, which is nearby, which some people believe, and there's been some studies done, that that particular facility may go out of existence if it does not uh, broaden its platform, broaden its offerings to go from the video to the table games and to really change it. And this particular question has a whole series of requirements of the developer to go through and spend forty million dollars in the facility and there's a whole conditions of more money to Newport so there's a whole set of conditions that are around this particular question but it's important for Newport to to authorize it or not authorize it. Uh, if it doesn't happen, then the question is what happens to the casino or the, or the facility after this, in fact, if they don't enlarge the to table games. And I should have said off the top, RIPEC does not take positions on whether voters should approve or, or not approve That's these correct. questions. You just correct. study them and try to help you understand what the yeah. impact yeah. Yeah. We take. think it's a better, better, I guess, process and better for us just to provide information as opposed to saying we're for it or against it. So Kelly, these two Newport Grand questions, what exactly uh, you know, there's, it can look like a lot of gobbledygook to people when they're a regular voter who doesn't deal with this kind of language a lot. What's question one really asking to do? What's question two really asking to do? So as John mentioned, um, the expansion of gaming at Newport Grand is really um, dependent upon the vote of the majority of local residents and then also the state. So the first question is regarding the expansion of gaming um, for the local residents in the state. And the second question relates to a change to the Constitution if the license, um, for instance, in Newport were to be moved, the geographic location of it were to be moved, this, this question um, allows for that to occur in, in a municipality. It would, the voters would have to have a majority vote to allow that locational change. To and that's, of course, because out. sometimes you've heard concerns in Newport from people who say, well, we'll let them add table games at Newport Grand, and then they'll move to, I don't know, Bellevue Avenue <laughs> into, a, into a mansion or something, right? Yeah, yes. And so this would block that. Um, do all four have to pass for the Paolino investor plan to go forward? Do I, excuse me, do both questions have to pass locally and statewide just for the, it to go forward? Just the first one for the development. And that's okay. the one that authorizes the extension of uh, table games at the, the casino. All right, so that's Newport Grand. If people want to know more about that, we've done shows. Check WPRI.com. We have those. Uh, Joe Paolino earlier in the year and then the opponents who don't agree with his plan there. Uh, so now let's go to question three. And this is interesting. This is voters, whether we should call in Rhode Island a state constitutional convention for the first time since 1986. So uh, get out our three-cornered hats and open up the Constitution <laughs> again yeah. here. Yeah. Um, we've heard strong arguments uh, being made on both sides. Mm -hmm. Some folks uh, in favor say it's a chance to do bigger things with changing 
government works, line on veto and such. Others say civil rights could be at issue. It's a can of worms. So, um, John, you're actually putting out a report on this this week, right, that people yes. can get on RIPEC's yeah, website. As so, we, As we're speaking now, it'll be out. There. Give people a sense of what, what would it mean to call a constitutional We dimension. think that this is probably, if not the most important question, it's as is, is high as you can get to, to open up the Constitution. We think it's a, the most important question before the voters this session. There is no doubt. Uh, last con uh, Constitutional Convention was in 1986. There's been every 10 years a vote, and 1986 was the That's last one. That's a requirement, one. actually, in Rhode Island Constitution. Within, under you our have Constitution, to have a vote right. every 10 years. Yes, right, and so they've had it in the last several years. The last several times they've said no to it. So what this really does is, is it takes a step back and opens up the full Constitution for the state, how we are governed, the civil society, and how it's governed by the state, and the, the authorization, the power of the government to, over people. We open that up for 75 delegates elected from House districts uh, to run for a delegate. The delegates pick their process and how they run themselves, what their rules are, whether a majority could be, you know, uh, 20 percent, 25 percent, you could have 15, 16, 17 people run the convention if you set the majority differently. So they set their own rules. They set their own conditions and what they want to talk about and how they want to talk about it. So they could take up almost anything and pass it out. Uh, there was a pre-convention pre uh, group that met and set up a set of items to be looked at. We looked at the 86 one and we found that less about half of them that were to be discussed in the pre-convention group was not even raised mm. at the real convention. For instance, the line item veto, the lieutenant governor's position. So there was no guarantee from that pre-convention group to the convention itself what will be taken up or not. It'll actually be 75 delegates, re uh, re as I say, elected, and they can take up anything they want uh, in any way they wish and put the questions out. They have to go on to the ballot. Uh, there's no stopping them if they're... If so they're actually, there. yeah, so just, uh, Kelly, you've, uh, you worked on that report that's coming out to mm -hmm. help people understand mm -hmm. how this would work. Walk people through, if you could, if this vote goes yes on a, having a con-con, like some people say, a constitutional mm -hmm. convention, what process does that kick off? I mean, can those people just write the constitution, it'll be over and done and rewritten? How does it work? So the first step is the voter ballot referendum, which will occur next week. And then the legislature will be responsible for crafting a set of rules that would govern um, the election of delegates. Uh, so as John mentioned, there will be 75 delegates, um, but the legislature has the ability to determine um, the, you know, the, the process for the election of those delegates. Once the delegates are selected, um, there's also a bipartisan preparatory commission, which is the, the report that John referenced um, that happened recently. Um, that will uh, well that has occurred for this upcoming election and then also the delegates will establish a set of rules for themselves to govern the convention and those rules are entirely flexible um, as we've seen in the past so they have the convention it could go as long as they want it could it's entirely up to them yes. and then and they then and then their proposals their come back. work then their work whatever they vote out will then go back to the voters at, at a general election Wow, so an enormous, really a weighty question there. So people, that's question three, and you want to take a, a close look and think hard about that before we do it. We have to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the other four questions, which are for something state lawmakers always love, borrowing money. So we're going to hear about what they want to borrow it for. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Executive Suite, I'm Ted Nisi, and this week, a pre-election episode, we're getting you ready for the ballot questions on the statewide ballot in Rhode Island. You don't see as many campaign commercials for those, but we're trying to help you understand what uh, what you're going to be voting on next week when you head into the booth once you get past the candidates. So I have with me from RIPEC, John Simmons and Kelly Rogers, and they're walking us through. So we talked about the first three questions in the first half, Now, first uh, segment. Now we're going to talk about the borrowing money questions. And Kelly, I'll uh, start with you. What is question four? Question four would um, authorize an expansion of URI's um, engineering school. So it would be a large facility. Um, the principal is $125 million, and then interest ranges depending on the interest rate. But it would really be a, a true physical expansion of their campus and engineering school. Okay, so that's that one. And uh, actually, before we go on to the other ones, uh, Kelly, I'll stick with you. You've, you looked uh, for your report on this at the state's debt levels. Um, is, can you generally characterize, how does it compare regionally and nationally, how much debt Rhode Island's government currently has before, if these get approved? Sure. Well, Moody's does an analysis of state debt medians, and they compare debt as a percentage of personal uh, personal income and also as a uh, on a per capita basis. 
And so on a per capita basis, Rhode Island ranks 10th in the United States. On a personal, percent of personal income basis, Rhode Island ranks 13th. So relatively high, but you actually see Massachusetts is like usually way out there at number one, right? right? So in our region, is actually Connecticut, one, yeah. excuse me. So uh, so it's come down from the 1990s, I think, in Rhode Island, the debt levels, but still relatively high compared to the rest of the country. All right. So that's the context before we decide whether to borrow more money. So John, that was question four, UI engineering. What is question five? Okay, the other one on, on five is the creative and cultural economy bonds, and there's a, about ten different buckets of funding. The nine of them are for a specific institutions, whether it's the Trinity Rep, Rhode Island Philharmonic, there's uh, eight, nine of them with a specific amount. There's a dollar, one dollar match uh, required of each of the institutions. And it's laid bonds. out right on the ballot. It's right in, laid out in the ballot so you know who's uh, getting the, the, the funding for it. Uh, and then again, it's about two and a half million dollar debt service payment and it's about 35 million dollar total for that particular bond. And then uh, it's not all earmarked money in that one, right? Though no. then they also want to create so a program? There's about six to seven million dollars for a program through the Arts Council that they would be able to award similar type of projects in Rhode Island. Or gotcha. So they'd have more money for that left yes. over from it. All right. So that's question five. Right. Back to you, Kelly. Then we'll go with what is question six. Question six relates to our mass infrastructure um, capacity. And so it would allocate $35 million to um, various infrastructure transportation um, projects, a major portion of which is in Providence with Kennedy Plaza. We see all the work being done there and everything. Now, why does it seems like that work's already going on. Why would we need to borrow money now? Do we know what exactly they want to do with the new money they'd get out of this at, at Kennedy Plaza and around there? A lot of it has to do with the relocation and, and better inter interconnectivity of the available transit um, options. So they want to move it to different places. Yes. Okay. And uh, John, on Kennedy Plaza, you, you laid out uh, a, a bunch of some questions people should think about. What sort of questions did you suggest people should think well, about as they decide? This one is the, the size of the borrowing. It's uh, $35 million. Is that the right size? Should they be paid in different ways? Uh, for instance, should you be borrowing this money? Uh, should the state be borrowing the money for this particular project so specifically to do some work that the city of Providence has some obligation for, the parking garage, for instance? And separating out the hubs and things of that nature, is that really what we should be spending money on first? What's the impact? If you look at the, one of the context questions is the overall debt service. Right now we're about 6.5% of the operating revenue. When we, we do all of these bonds, it'll go to 8% of the operating budget. So it becomes a fairly expensive uh, item. It crowds out many of the items. So you have to look at the nature of the project. Should they be funded separately? Is it pay-go, current dollars, as opposed to borrowing money for some of the, the infrastructure and then the overall debt size? And of course, that's money, some of those concerns go for all of them. Um, yep. Were there any specific things I should have asked before on four or five that you suggested specifically yeah, about uh, those uses? Yeah, if, if you look at, you know, I think on four on the engineering school, what's the opportunity cost? If you don't create a, a, you know, a very good facility there, are we losing an opportunity for training of engineers, a full gamut of engineering uh, out of URI for our employers within Rhode Island? The next on the, the cultural bonds, there is a specific, should the state be supporting a public funds for private purposes? Each one of the nine institutions are privately held, they're not for profits, but should the state be spending that amount of money and the size of them, about two, three million dollars a piece, is that something you want to borrow 20 years for? Mm -hmm. And so we have some questions about whether that's an appropriate use of uh, borrowing capacity. Again, as you talked earlier, it, we do raise ourselves up on the uh, debt <laughs> limitations, right. and right. we are high in the country, and also the debt service payments. For those. So finally, only about a minute left, Kelly. What's question seven? Question seven relates to um, enhancements for clean water, open space, and healthy communities. So there are several different proposals in that category, some of which relate to um, clean water infrastructure abatement projects, some support um, our local farms. Um, there's a range of op um, uh, details for these various proposals. The clean Water Financing Agency has 20 million in uh, that broader question. And John, that's the last one there. What's any questions Same specifics thing. to question seven? Part of that seven. is uh, some $15 million goes to Roger Williams Park, the zoo. Is that something that the state should be supporting a city-owned or city-run asset? The dollar size is the same. Uh, you have really the park, you have a whole host of others. The water, clean water is to actually to assist municipals in lowering their debt costs. Is that something the state should be doing? 
as opposed to the municipalities paying for it directly for themselves because it doesn't affect all 39 communities it only affects those who are coming through the clean water process and i'm sure everyone will study hard before <laughs> they vote on each of these questions but you can't say that RIPEC didn't give you the information you needed so i want to thank you both before we go to break right, for coming right, and right. doing this if you need more information wpri.com has a whole rundown of the ballot questions and on RIPEC's website you can get their reports on all these questions as well but don't go away because coming up next we have christine kadeen talking about background checks becoming an increasingly important part of how employers figure out who they're going to hire. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm going to talk now with Christine Kaneen. She's the CEO of Higher Image LLC in Johnston, which does a lot of background checks, things I'm glad that Channel 12 never checked before I got this job. <laughs> but uh, Christine, thank you for being here. So, uh, you know, explain to people, what do you do at Higher Image and sort of what, how does this work? You know, we all kind of know it's there, but we don't know how it's done. Sure. So, um, background screening companies work with employers across the country searching criminal courthouses. So, actually have court researchers that go into the courthouses to search the records. And we have clients from Alaska to Puerto Rico and everywhere in between. So, it's not just local, it's not just nonprofits, it's not just for profit. It's any company, any size. You might have a doctor's office that hires one person a year. You could have a call center that's hiring thousands of people a year but it's important for every organization to get those searches done. And, and you are not compliant. just any background screener, you are now the chair, congrats, of the National Association of Professional Background Screeners. Just took over last week, I think, right? Yes, uh, last week was our annual conference in Denver and I took over as the uh, chair, so that's exciting. Um, so that's, it's just under a thousand member companies and we work, we have certification programs, accreditation programs for member companies, which I'm proud to announce Higher Image was accredited this past year, congrats so that's, that a, that's a big deal. Uh, but yes, we work with um, background screeners throughout the country to make sure that they're educated and that they're compliant and helping employers in the right way. And we also work legislatively down in D.C. I'm actually heading to D.C. this Sunday. I will be back Tuesday for uh, to vote. <laughs> to Good. Vote. Now you know about the ballot question. <laughs> yes, so that was helpful. <laughs> How um, how did you get into this business? That's a, that's a good question. So I'm a CPA in my past life. I l in really enjoy working with many different companies, but knew I didn't want to be partner in public accounting and I have an entrepreneurial spirit. So one of my clients was a private investigator. So my partner now, Tom, is a uh, former law enforcement. So he's kind of the behind the scenes guy. I um, talked to him about linking up and trying to grow this business and just focusing on employment screening. So together, we've been together now for 10 years and we've just been expanding year after year. I've got a bunch of specific questions, but I have to ask first, what's the, the worst thing you've ever uncovered in this background screen? <laughs> I would say the story that gets the most chuckles. <laughs> I mean, we, we get the murderers, we get the rapists, we get Yikes. those pedophiles and the, the bad things. But probably the most interesting one was the man who changed his first name by a few digits and got a fake ID and changed his name and was dressing as a woman to go to work. And the employer had already hired him and let him work before completing the background search. Come to find out, we had figured out that he was under an alias name, and it wasn't him. And his prior criminal record was beating up pregnant ladies. He had a fetish for beating up pregnant ladies, and here he was in an office using the ladies' room because uh, he was dressed as a woman. So that was wow. probably the most <laughs> interesting. Really. Yeah. Like, but we'd say the most popular things that we see are resume fraud. So employment verifications, education verifications, so important to check that. You might remember Providence School Administrator that just had a... Uh, degree from an unaccredited school. So we check for those things for employers and find that every day. Really, that's very frequent now. Very frequent. I'm just kind of surprised people do that so much. It seems like it would get easier and easier to check. It's easier and easier to check, but some employers, if they're not checking that it's accredited, they might check and say, oh yes, I, the person has the degree, but it's a diploma mill. There's also these um, industries that have popped up that you can pay money that someone is going to um, verify your resume. So yes, uh, Ted worked at Dell Computers as a software engineer, but it never really happened. So we have ways that we're making sure we're going through the HR departments and not just calling who somebody supplies their number gotcha. based I, on a fake Another resume. thing I want to ask about, because uh, it's always coming up in, uh, with my friends and I, we always wonder about this, the use of social media to screen employees, is that, is that something you do regularly now and is it, is it allowed? That's a great question. Social media and screening is a lot more popular over the last few years. What I caution applicants is be careful what you're putting out there. What I caution employers, and more and more employers are doing it internally themselves, but background screeners also offer that service. And the difference between doing it themselves or outsourcing it to a professional background screener is the employer 
once you're looking on the social media, you're going to find out someone's sexual orientation, their age, their religious affiliation. You can't kind of unring that bell uh -huh. on some discriminatory practices. If you outsource it to a professional background screener, you can just say, hey, I want to know if there's drug use, is there disparaging comments about an employer, um, any talk of violence. So you can kind of limit what you're looking for. But social media is a tough thing. We've seen had cases where a boyfriend has gotten the password of a girlfriend's Facebook account and written certain things. And so it's kind of hard to check, did that person really put that out there? But I mean, pictures do uh, <laughs> paint the picture a lot. We time. also now have a ban the box law in Rhode Island, right? What does that do and what do employers need to know about it? Yeah, so Ban the Box was, um, it, it was brought upon, upon by ex-offenders, advocates for ex-offenders, to basically take the question off an initial job application, have you been convicted of a crime? So the advocates say that's not giving those ex-offenders a chance to re-enter society. So I think we can all agree that's a, a laudable goal. I think what happens is we're kind of pushing it onto the employers now. So Rhode Island and many other states have passed laws to say, hey, take it off the initial application, but you can ask about it later on in the process. Luckily for Rhode Island employers, it's just about taking it off the initial application. Many other states, they're causing other um, things that employers have to find. Is it job related? Is, you know, how, how, how can this be used? So multi-state employers are really challenged because it's not just states anymore, it's cities. We have mm -hmm. Newark and San Francisco and Seattle coming up with kind of crazy laws. I call it ban the box on steroids. Wow. But we're lucky here in Rhode Island and Massachusetts, it's just a straight ban the box. Don't ask it on the initial application. So um, you also have tips for employers to avoid getting in trouble because they're not maybe inadvertently fo following the federal guidelines for hiring practices and everything on discrimination. What sort of tips do you give on that? Right, that's a, that's a great point. We're seeing more and more lawsuits where employers they might be using computerized systems and not taking into consideration when you're when you're providing background screening it's regulated by the Fair Credit Reporting Act and under that act there's certain compliance uh, items you have to follow you have to have a signed authorization and disclosure form and give that applicant a summary of their rights and on those forms you can't have it attached to the initial application it has to be a separate clear and conspicuous a uh, separate piece of paper for them to sign. So that's the number one thing. There's a lot of in-house attorneys that might add like a release of liability onto there. That we've seen a lot of class action lawsuits of major employers that have kind of gotten caught up in that. So you want to talk to your employment attorney, your background screening professionals to make sure that your forms are in compliance. And then when you're not going to hire somebody, to make sure you're giving them notice. Give them a copy of their report so they can see it. We have had instances where a father has used his son's ID, so it's not his record. So give them a chance to dispute their record. So there's steps with that too, and the background screening company should be able to help the employer. Only about 30 seconds left. If the viewers could be left with anything about how to do this stuff right, what would you tell them? I would say definitely talk to your employment attorney, um, your background screening professional, have a background screening policy, but don't be afraid to do background checks. I think they're so important. I don't care if you're hiring one person, hundreds of people, it's so important to do background checks because you want to know who you're hiring and who you're sending into your customers' homes. All right, Christine Kanin, she's the new chair of the National Association of Professional Background Screeners and she's CEO of Higher Image in uh, headquartered in Johnson. Thank you okay. so much for coming in today. And thank you to John Simmons and Kelly Rogers for being there in the first half. If you missed any of this episode, or any other episode of Executive Suite, you can catch all those on WPRI.com. Don't forget to vote November 4th, and we'll have all the coverage you need on WPRI 12. See you next week on Executive Suite.